History happened everywhere. The verdict. This is our After Show podcast where we look back at the most recent episode, episode 95, Sculpture in the Netherlands during the second millennium. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and check it out or else there will be spoilers ahead. What's a butt plug? Hello, my name is Ryan Weir and I'm here in the HHE studio with the fisherman's friend to my gaping gawper, it's Mr Peter Goddard. I don't know why you're gaping but I'm happy to be a hot lozenge. You are a hot lozenge and to be fair to those people who don't know what a fisherman's friend is, it's the most dreadful thing on the planet. A tasteless treat. (laughs) If only they were tasteless. If only they were a treat. And we are joined, as ever, by the dutiful Dutch dammer. It's the judge himself. It's Mr. Paul Dursley. Hooden Avant, gentlemen. Now, Peter, I have spent the past week gaping at a wall in a medically induced opium haze, and as such, I've forgotten everything we talked about during the episode. So, would you mind reminding me what happened in, let's say, 60 seconds? Oh, I definitely could. When would you like me to do it? Do it now! We travelled to the Netherlands, home of the tallest people in the world who reclaimed much of their homeland from the sea. We learned all about William of Orange and how he may have impacted the colour of our carrots today. And we discovered sculptures, including the likely lad whose statue played host to the doings of anarchists in the 60s, the Gapers exotic head sculptures that served as an advertisement for the wonderful wares of 16th century pharmacists. And we met Barry, the wooden head from a Dutch warship that was saved from beneath the waves by fishermen and is now looking forward to a new air-conditioned home. It was sculpture. It was the second millennium. It was the Netherlands. That was last week's episode done Summarised nicely, nice one son Now we're over to a young Dursley Who's gonna tell you what he thought of me He'll take you apart without any care He's the lovely Paul Dursley The lovely Paul Dursley Ah, yes, I remember now, and what a rock-solid episode it was. In fact, I would say it was marvellous. Oh, my God. Mm. (laughs) But what does it matter what I think? Because we're here for the opinion of just one man, Judge Dursley. So, Paul, before we convene the court and receive your final ruling, why don't you kick us off with your first impressions of episode 95? Well... Like Pete, I, I've been to the Netherlands many times. I've actually lived there for a while, so I know a bit about it. So, What was it like living there? I've only ever gone for like a long weekend. And a lost weekend. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was I was working there a, lo- a long while ago, and so... You weren't in one of those windows, were you? <laughs> no, no, we were. Were you a shrimp fisherman? <laughs> <laughs> I I I had lived I lived at the Pulitzer Hotel for about three months. Oh wow! And how did you find the people and the place? Well, it was just like a suburb of London, really. Yeah, everyone was speaking English, and you sort of just could tootle in and get get whatever you wanted. And we were living on the Herengrax, you know, one of the main canals, and they used to pop around. Yeah, a lot of dog shit in Amsterdam. I recall there was a hostel that was the known as a cheap and terrible hostel, and they conducted a marketing campaign in which they put the flags of the hostels in the various dog poos they could find around the streets of Amsterdam. (laughs) Well, talking of dog poo, in my research, I discovered that in Amsterdam, there is a statue of a small dog pooping. So perhaps (laughs) it was put there for you. The article that I read said that it was put there to showcase overlooked moments in life. But I suspect it's more the fact that uh, Judge Dursley thinks there's a lot of dog poo in Holland. There used to be in the 90s. I hope it was dogs as well. I found some other strange Dutch statues. Would you like to hear some of them? I would. Okay, so in Rotterdam, there's a statue known as the Butt Plug Gnome. <laughs> Yeah, it's officially named Santa Claus, and it was created by Paul McCarthy and depicts Santa Claus holding an object that looks like a butt plug, but is actually meant to represent a Christmas tree. <laughs> oh, well, he's, he's misjudged that, hasn't he? <laughs> In Den Bosch, there's a statue called Gift of Life, which features a man's lower body giving birth to a bird which has been penetrated by an arrow. That feels like a fever dream of some kind. <laughs> yeah, it sure does. 
Are you uh, are you going to put these on your website? <laughs> yeah, we'll take some pictures and uh, post them online. Uh, there used to be a fountain in Amsterdam that was shaped like a penis, but it was removed by the city council in the 1980s. Oh, that's funny because I also came up with a statue that was in the red light district, which was a plaque. It was on the ground. It's like a breast, but it's embedded in the pavement. And I think originally it was dug up because it was anonymously put in and under the cover of night, I guess. Okay. Then the, the council, I think, removed it, but then they came to an accommodation with the artist somehow and uh, now they've placed it back on the uh, periphery of the red light district okay art vandalism well they're, they're, they're probably setting them around to mark the boundary of the red light district you know it's a nice idea yeah i'll keep abreast of news and see if any more come up well, hey uh, i need to stop doing those <laughs> I, I disappointed myself for that one <laughs> <laughs> now you know what I feel like. <laughs> Talking of women, though, in Rotterdam, there's a bronze statue known as the Selfie, which depicts a group of women taking a selfie together. That it gets meta very quickly, doesn't it? I like that. Uh, there's a giant sperm cell on the rooftop of a church in Arnhem. Oh, a church? <laughs> yeah. Every sperm is sacred, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's part of a collection of magnified microorganisms that include a virus particle and a large tardigrade, or a water bear, as you might know them. Oh, I love a tardigrade. But, but my favourite statue, though, is in Rotterdam, and it's the statue of the second tallest Dutchman in history. He's called Regardus Reinholdt, and he was uh, 2.4 metres tall, that's 7 foot 6.5 inches, and he weighed over 500 pounds. He wore size 29 shoes, and he's said to have needed five times the amount of food as most men. Apparently he suffered from a hormonal disorder of the uh, pituary gland. Uh, and as a young adult, he actually rented himself out as a walking billboard for local companies. <laughs> <laughs> lean into it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, he had to stop doing that, though, because he was involved in a bicycle crash that put him in a wheelchair for the rest of his life, which sadly wasn't very long because age 36, his health deteriorated quickly. And having been lifted by a crane to the second floor of the local hospital, he died of a tumour within a matter of hours. Oh, shame. Yeah. yeah, they all, they, it's, yeah, they all, they all follow the same trajectory with that pituitary. Yeah. The overactive pituitary, it makes them tall like Robert Wadlow or Robert Pershing Wadlow was something like eight foot eleven. Wow. A ridiculous height. That's really, really very tall. And yeah, he died young as well. Yeah. Ah, oh, poor guys. Uh, in 2011, though, the life-size bronze statue was erected close to his family home, which apparently is pretty much unrecognisable from when he lived in it, apart from the extra-large door that was installed for him many years ago. <laughs> apparently it's a Chinese supermarket now, so you can go and buy your Chinese goods there. The thing I was struck by was that he was the second tallest Dutchman. Why would you select the second tallest for the honour? Also, they should have made the statue out of silver, not bronze, because otherwise he would have been the third tallest. <laughs> yes, but, but of course, in the local district, he is the tallest person that there has ever been there. So I could understand it if it was in Amsterdam, it may be rather odd. But if it's just outside where he used to live... Ah, yes. Fair, fair point. Anyway, there you go. Strange statues. If you see any of them, let us know. Yeah, and we should definitely tweet some pictures of those. Let's get tweeting. Is that your new catchphrase? Let's get tweeting. I'm trying to show you I'm going to make tweeting happen. Let's get tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that it? Shouldn't it be called Xing? Yeah, let's get Xing. No. So, chaps, I have some exciting news. Well, tell us. So, you know that we have not published this episode in quite the normal schedule, and probably we should talk about that before I talk about my exciting news. Yeah, we should do, really, shouldn't we? Yes. Why have I been sitting here ten days waiting to talk to you about this? <laughs> yes, I'm glad you spotted that. Well, I rushed, uh, turns... I rushed to listen to it, and then it was cancelled. So I'm, I'm doing this from memory, you know. <laughs> well, fortunately, you have a formidable memory. But yes, what has happened is the good burgers of HHE podcast, that is to say myself and Ryan, have decided to make the show a monthly event. Oh, is it too much work for you? Exactly <laughs> correct. That is too much work <laughs> for us. <laughs> so that is why this is later than normal. So sorry to everyone who liked them more frequently, but, uh, you know, we had to try and accommodate the situation. 
now. The advantage of this is that we are now able much more effectively to take feedback that we get from listeners into the show. And we have got one for this very first episode. We have a listener and a good friend of the show who, and a very conveniently Dutch person called Stephen who wrote to us and said, When I started the podcast, I was sure that it was going to be at one major Dutch event, the Bildenstorm or Statue Storm. I believe in English it's typically referred to as the Iconoclast Fury. Wow. So I looked into it a bit more, but he gave us a great rundown of it. But courtesy of Stephen, I'm going to tell you about the Iconoclast Fury. Uh, First of all, this doesn't bode well for your score, does it? If you've missed the most important thing out. Didn't show up in my research at all. No, me either, actually. (laughs) Which (laughs) astonishes me, given the the various keywords we use when we're searching for stuff. But here's what happens. So the context is it's part of the conflict between Calvinist Protestants and Catholics in the Netherlands, which is part of the broader Protestant Reformation in which across Europe, Catholics and Protestants don't get along very well. So well, what, were, they, were, they, were the Protestants annoyed that the Catholics put a big sperm on the top of their church? <laughs> <laughs> I believe this was pre-sperm sculpture, but uh, it was nonetheless quite a vigorous disagreement. So many of the people in Holland were Protestant, but their nation was part of the territory that was under control of Philip II of Spain, who was a devout Catholic. Not a very tolerant man. Not tolerant at all, in fact. So in the mid-1500s, the people of the Netherlands could be imprisoned for worshipping as Protestants. So one day they came along and they asked their rulers, uh, the sort of proxy ruler for the king, they said, would you mind if we worshipped in a slightly different way to you? And they said, no, <laughs> which, as you can imagine, doesn't end well. Protestants then just have their sermons in the open air. These large congregations start forming, and these large congregations soon become well, roaming mobs, basically, not averse to popping into their local Catholic church and smashing up the icons, all the statues and the stained glass, hence the iconoclastic fury. Ah. So in 1566, this reaches a peak. It's a kind of an epidemic of rioting and smashing up churches and icons in, uh, in various Catholic establishments. So in 1566 in Antwerp and Ghent, in the space of a few days, crowds managed to demolish or trash up or wreck a cathedral, eight churches, 25 monasteries and convents, 10 hospitals and seven chapels. 25 (laughs) monasteries? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, They were busy, busy people. I suppose the monks probably wouldn't put up much of a fight. Yeah, I guess not. So King Philip's representative, who was called Margaret of Parma, came to an accord, it's known as, with the Protestant leaders, which gave them freedom of religion in exchange for an end to the violence but it's kind of too late it's already taken off so a gentleman is brought in to bring about some kind of peace and this gentleman was named William and do you know where he was of? Was he of orange? He was of orange, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and two years later, the 80 Years' War that you talked about, Ryan, was underway. Yeah. It was sparked by a lot of different things, but one of them was this mania for smashing up statues during the Storm. So, Stephen, thank you so much, listener. That's great input. Uh, and this is one of the major advantages of having less frequent episodes. We can get listener feedback and great new stories like that. That's awesome. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Which came first, William of Orange or the Colour Orange? <laughs> and I'll tell you about that after this. Oh, oh, oh beautiful. Okay, so we were talking there just about William of Orange and I did a bit more research because I was wondering, is William of Orange called Orange because of the citrus, you know, the, the, the fruit that we eat? <laughs> Other way round. And it turns out that's not the case. <laughs> Orange, Orange Nassau, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, so I looked into where the orange in the title comes from and yeah, it's nothing to do with the citrus. It's apparently to do with an area in southern France called the Principality of Orange. It's an area that the Romans call Orosia, which evolved, I guess, over several centuries into the word orange. Anyway, in the 16th century, a rich family moved there called the Nassaus. They took over the area and became known as the Nassaus of Orange. Yeah, their neighbours were the Dukes of Grapefruit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and so in 1544, when the reigning Prince of Orange, uh, he died with no direct heirs, it named his 11-year-old cousin William as his successor and he made him one of the wealthiest and most influential nobles in Europe. So that's where the name William of Orange comes from. And that money has stayed with the Dutch royal family. They're one of the wealthiest royal families in the world. They really are. That's exactly right. But it nearly didn't happen because when Charles V, who was the King of Spain at the time, 
And Holy Roman Emperor. And Holy Roman Emperor and current occupier of the Netherlands. He heard about William inheriting all this money and power, and he reasoned that it would make sense to have him on his side. So he set out a number of conditions that William had to meet to receive the full amount of the inheritance. <laughs> Most notably, he insisted that William be raised at his imperial court in Belgium under the supervision of his sister, Mary of Hungary. And so that's what happened. William travelled to Brussels, where he was essentially groomed to be a loyal servant to the king. And as he got older, he rose through the ranks and was eventually appointed governor of several Dutch provinces. But as you pointed out earlier, Pete, the introduction of the Spanish Inquisition to the Netherlands caused him to start to question what he was so involved with. <laughs> that was very <laughs> unexpected. Yeah, we, yeah, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, so yeah, so William petitioned the king and he asked him to just, you know, chill out a bit. That was refused. Riots broke out and Philip responded with bloody purges of the rebels, which then spooked William and he ran off to Germany where he organised the resistance. That kick-started the Dutch Revolution. Philip was outraged and declared William an outlaw. He offered money and a title to anyone who killed him. And uh, this was an inspiration to a number of people, including a guy called Balthazar Gerard, who posed as a French nobleman, entered William's court, where he pretended to be one of his closest supporters, but was really just looking for the best opportunity to kill him. And that day came on July the 10th, 1584, when Gerard waited in the shadows of a stairwell for William to appear. And when he did, he stepped out and fired his pistol at close range. He hit William in the chest and the face, and he died. Gerard was captured by William's guards, he was put on trial, he was tortured and executed by having his hand cut off, being disemboweled and then quartered to death. And after that, did he pick up his reward? Was it worth it? On <laughs> reflection. <laughs> this was a bad idea. <laughs> so there you go, William of Orange, not a fruit. So, Ryan, I had some research that I didn't use in the episode, and you mentioned in the episode that in the UK we had this Bristol statue that was pushed over because he was a slave owner and it was controversial. Not just pushed over, he was dragged and then thrown into the harbour, wasn't he? He was indeed, and there's a there's a similar statue in the Netherlands, actually, which has a similar controversial past, you might say. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in 1893, in a town called Hoorn, just north of Amsterdam, there was a statue erected of a man named Jan Peterson Cohen, or J.P. Cohen. So he was an officer of the Dutch East India Company in the early 17th century, and he served two terms as Governor General of the Dutch East Indies. And he was celebrated in this role as the man who led the company to dominance in the area. So he brought loads and loads of wealth to the Netherlands, and consequently, he gets a statue. Dominance has a darker subtext, doesn't it? Well, yes, it does indeed, because over time, sensibilities changed, as you discussed, and people start to become more conscious of the methods used by some of these great men to get this wealth into the country. And J.P. P. Cohen used some very, very ugly methods. He brutally culled the people of the Banda Islands in particular. Uh, he was responsible for the deaths of about 14,000 people, which is a lot, but is even more when you realise the population was 15,000 people. Wow. Basically depopulates the island. That's how you get the nickname the Slaughterer of Banda. Yeah. Now, even at the time his statue was erected, there were concerns. There was a Dutch socialist called Ferdinand de Mella Neuhuis who called Cohen a bloodhound. But the statue went up. But over time, people become more and more conscious, right, of these problematic representations because by and large, a statue of someone indicates approval of that thing, right? Indeed. So since the 1960s, with the rise of anti-colonialism, these statues have become more and more controversial. A lot of people say this statue has to go. It gets vandalised, gets paint thrown on it in the last few decades. Uh, and it's a real problem. They're not sure what to do with it. In 2011, Huon Council tried to balance the statue by putting up an extra plaque that kind of gave the context to the acts of the man. But some people say that's still not enough. You've still got a statue of this man and that's still a celebration of him. And it's an issue that is hotly debated today in, in the UK as it is in the Netherlands, and I'm sure other places in the world. But I'm, I'm pleased to tell you, Ryan, in February this year, the council came together to make a decision as to what to do, and they decided to wait for a bit and discuss the matter a bit more and think mm. some more about it all. Um, more discussion, that's what's needed. Exactly. So we don't know what's going to happen to J.P. Cohen, but the, I thought it was an interesting example of how the habit of putting up statues of people, initially because of their greatness and their contribution to something, can actually become something very different and controversial. And over time, you know, these statues, they, they sit in our public spaces, yet they don't necessarily 
necessarily mean the same thing as time passes. There's a part of me that admires ripping statues down and throwing them into harbours. But at the same time, I think the appropriate response is taking down controversial statues and putting them in museums where the background and context can be more adequately given. Well, so, so, certainly the statue should not be destroyed because that's just destroying history, whether that history is good or bad. I think you. I, I agree with you, Ryan, in that the presence of a statue in a place, regardless of what the plaques might say, most people would not read the plaque and they're going to assume some form of approval. We don't make statues of things we don't approve of. There are very few statues to murderers and the like. So the fact that there is a statue of something implies, I think, approval of it and therefore take it down and move it somewhere it's part of history it needs to be explained but uh, i think having it in a public space is not something that i would support or you build you keep the statue there and you build a counter statue a couple of bandit islanders flicking him the v's (laughs) (laughs) a bit petty but sort of it has the point i'm just starting a conversation here Peter, you uh, brought us a story about shrimp fishermen who uh, made the discovery of Barry. Barry the head, yes, indeedy. But it seems like those shrimp fishermen weren't the only ones who have a talent for archaeology because on the 14th of April 1970, another Dutch fisherman called Kees Balt, he discovered four large pieces of stone in his nets while fishing in uh, Osterschelde. So researchers took the stones, they did some examination of them, and they realised that the inscriptions that were written on these stones meant that they were parts of altars that were dedicated to an ancient water goddess and patron of seafarers, a goddess called Nehelania, a name which means she who is at the sea. And it's thought that the altars that these stones came from were probably submerged by the sea as early as the 3rd century AD. I'm slightly nervous that these stones were protecting us from the emergence of this evil sea goddess who's going to come and kill us all. <laughs> yeah. This is the beginning of so many movies. <laughs> Put the stones back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the fragments that Keyes found, they were embedded in the clay soil, which preserved them, much like Barry was. And the stones are now on display at the Netherlands in Roman Times exhibit at the uh, Dutch National Museum of Antiquities in Leiden. And since their discovery, hundreds of other altars have since been found, including several statues and two temples. Uh, in fact, if you travel to the small village of Collinsblatt, you can find a replica village built in 2005, which is complete with a temple that was there sometime around 150 CE. This does explain the price of fish in the Netherlands. <laughs> Did you get any fish this time? No, just altars again. <laughs> just a holy grail. <laughs> Well, there we are, gentlemen. We have come to the end of the line, and it's time for us to step into the dock, Peter, and prepare to face the people's judge. I am ready. Judge Dursley, are you ready to give your verdict? I am. Then will the defendants please rise? Yes, I will. Your Honour, as usual, may we start proceedings by first asking for your verdict on factual content. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to mark you down a bit for missing something which uh, your dust listeners have pointed out. Stephen! You've given us a bad grade, Stephen. You've ruined us. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'll, I'll just take a little bit away. But but, but but, apart from that, yes, it was a very interesting, an interesting study into an interesting country. So I will dock you one mark and give you C plus. C plus. I like Love a C plus because our episode had the C in it. So C it plus did. means it had the C and it was even better than that. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Your Honour, then may we have your grade for entertainment value? Well, I was going to rate it on the the status of the sketches, but as it was so long ago, I can't remember any of the sketches that were in this one. Probably for the best. I was just going to say, that probably means you'll get a slightly higher grade than you usually would have done. (laughs) Uh, Just to recap for you, they were all hilarious. Hmm. 
Okay, so for entertainment, I found it rather entertaining. I, I like Holland and, and and that whole area, especially all of the reclamation schemes, that the Isselmere and the Cider Sea. So for that reason, I would give you a... B. 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 Hooray! I'm agape, Peter. My, my face is agape. Okay, then Judge, may we move on to Dursley Factor? Did this tickle your funny bone? Well, that's an easy answer, no. But it piqued my interest and for the je ne sais quoi factor, I think I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and this time I'll give you B minus. Peter, this is a high score in episode. I'm enjoying this. Yeah. Very excited. All right. Well, look, we have reached the final verdict. But before the judge passes his ruling, Peter, we have an opportunity to enter a plea. If we choose to do so, we should make that plea now. I think, like Barry the Head, we should rest quietly under the seafloor until we get our result. <laughs> Quick, silt me up. <laughs> For more silt, please. <laughs> OK, well, Your Honour, the defendants stand before you. Have you reached a verdict? Yes, I have reached a verdict. In which case, I would ask most respectfully for your ruling. I, I think quite surprisingly, I enjoyed I enjoyed this episode, although I do have to give you a slight negative on the timescales. I rushed to listen to it, and then I was left dangling for ten days. Oh, he doesn't like dangling. No, don't don't dangle the Dursleys. Don't dangle the Dursley. That's everyone says that. <laughs> 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 okay, I'm not going to be so bad. I'm going to give you C double plus. C double plus. I don't know what that is, but I'm delighted. <laughs> <laughs> We've never had a C plus plus before. <laughs> okay, okay, you could take it as a B minus. Yay! Yay! Okay, well, look, there you go. That is the show for this week. If you'd like to get in touch about any of the things that we've talked about on this show, or just to say hello, you can reach out to us on social media through our website at hhepodcast.com or by email at Pete and Ryan at hhepodcast.com. That's right. We'd love to hear from you. And you never know, you might end up featured on a future show like Stephen was today. One way to definitely feature on a future episode is to rate and review the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Your recommendation there goes a long way to bringing the show to new listeners and of course if you're on mastodon facebook instagram or x you can find us at hhe podcast if you subscribe there you'll get an alert when we post extra content tidbits news photos anything that we can think of really and we're going to be back again very soon with our next episode episode 96 botany in costa rica during 1603 to 1868 ah i i know a bit about that well, that's more than me <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime a huge thank you to the judge himself thank you paul my pleasure and that's it i guess all that's left to say is you've been gawping at right so we were talking about william of orange earlier which there were there were loads of williams of orange there were and there's actually 40 public statues and sculptures of william of orange across the netherlands today and one of the most famous is in plain square in den haag and it depicts william standing there regally next to a dog which apparently once saved william's life what did he do he did donate his kidneys <laughs> yeah william had dog kidneys <laughs> <laughs> no, according to legend, in 1572, William and his army were in France, right? They'd made camp for the night. So William had retired to his tent and he'd fallen asleep when around midnight, outside the camp, a thousand men armed with pikes came charging out of these hidden trenches and made their way into the camp. Now, while all of this was happening, William was asleep. But luckily for him, his dog, a pug named Pompey, was asleep at the foot of his bed. And the dog was 
woke up and started barking, but this didn't wake William up, so Pompey jumped onto the bed and started to scratch at William, but that didn't wake him up either, so Pompey did the only other thing he could do. Did he wee on him? He shat on him. No, he just sat on his face. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Pompey sat on William's face and that was enough to wake him up. And uh, as he woke up, uh, he found a small group of soldiers entering his tent. Uh, but moving quickly, William managed to escape. And so later, William recognised Pompey's quick thinking by making Pugs the official dog of the House of Orange. And apparently when he ascended the throne, he made sure that Pompey was there attending the ceremony dressed in orange ribbons. That is great. Please tell me that the statue of William of Orange with the pug has the pug on his face. <laughs> <laughs> no. Ah, damn. <laughs> I'd love to see that. I would pay to see that. <laughs> Well, chaps, I had something that I re-recorded in the show, but we didn't have time for it. Died in the edit, which was the Netherlands, as you pointed out, Ryan, is sometimes known informally in a weird Dutch versus Netherlander combination. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's fascinating. I wonder if this will make it to the edit. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, lovely YouTube folks. This is a special message just for you. Yeah, thanks for listening all the way to the end. Now, if you enjoyed the show, please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to take a moment to hit that like and smash subscribe. Hit that like? Yeah. Smash subscribe? Yeah, that's what people say. Do they, though? Yeah, only the cool kids. And you think you're the cool kids, do you? No, we're the cool kids. Oh, yeah, I suppose we are. All right, smash that like button, people. Smash it real good. Oh, yeah. Nice.